I want you to think about this with me for a second. If you were a superhero, what superpower would you have? Like, like I can't decide. I mean, there's so many choices, right? I can't decide between super strength or, or flight or even invisibility, but, but for sure I've got some thoughts about the costume. I'd want like a really cool logo, you know, emblem on the chest. I'd want, I'd want a helmet or, or a mask or maybe both. Uh, don't forget about the secret identity, you know, something like uh, uh, Clark Kent, Bruce Wayne, Tony Stark, that's what I'm talking about, a, a secret identity like that. And, and what about the base or the headquarters, your own personal bat cave or fortress of solitude? How awesome would that be? It'd be super cool, right? Was anybody here like into superheroes when you were a kid? I have to admit, I was into superheroes. Like, I like to watch superhero cartoons on TV. I, I like to read superhero comic books. And if I'm keeping it real, sometimes I even like to pretend that I was a superhero. Now, kids today have got it made. I mean, you can imagine for us, nine months in the road, California to Maine and back again, uh, our 10-year-old has to pass a lot of hours. And so she does that with an iPad. And, and that's why I think kids today are so lucky. You know, back in the day, an iPad was an Etch-a-Sketch. I mean, with, with, <laughs> with their cell phones and their tablets and their gaming systems, kids are never more than one click away from being able to pretend to be almost anyone or, or to do almost anything. But when I was a kid, if I wanted to play superhero, mom did not hand me an iPad. She handed me a tattered old bat towel and a safety pin. I'd wrap that towel around my shoulders and, you know, cinch it up under my chin. Mom would help me get it pinned, and, and hours of fun would follow. Now, kids today would get like five minutes out of that, and the first four would be spent complaining about how lame it was. We could make it work all day long, right? But isn't it true that even as adults, there's something inside of us that longs to be heroic? Isn't there something inside of you that wants to do something heroic, that wants to live heroically? That's what we're going to talk about in our time together. So if you would, uh, open your Bible with me to Joshua chapter 2. There we're going to meet a woman who was a hero, who did something heroic, who learned to live heroically. And from her life, we're going to learn the things that we're going to need to do if we too are going to live heroically. Joshua chapter 2, even as you're finding your place, I'm going to pray and just Ask, Father, that you would speak to us now through your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would, would fill this place, would fill us, and that you would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So the first thing we've got to do if we're going to live heroically is we've got to let go of the past. Look with me at uh, verse 1. It says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. Now, this is a generation after the Exodus. If you haven't read the book, you've seen the movie, right? The Ten Commandments of Charlton Heston. Maybe you went the animated route and you saw the Prince of Egypt. The point is that this story takes place right after that story. So Joshua has succeeded Moses. The people have crossed the river. They're ready to conquer the land that God has promised to them. And that's when they come to this place called Acacia Grove. Now, if that place name sounds familiar, it should. It was there in Acacia Grove just one generation before that the men of Israel, their fathers, were seduced by the women of Moab. And so long story short, as a result of their unfaithfulness to God and their unfaithfulness to their families, 24,000 people died. Which is to say that for many people, well, they had to go forward without a husband or, or they had to go forward without a father or a son. They had to go forward without a brother or they had to go forward without an uncle or a nephew. And you know that every year on an anniversary, they would be reminded. You know that every year on a birthday, they would be reminded. You know as they gathered in this place where all these things happened, that they were reminded of how the choices of one generation affect the next. It makes me think about how I've been um, affected by the choices that my parents made. And it challenges me to think about how the choices that, that I'm making are affecting my daughters and now granddaughter. And so, you know, with that in mind, maybe your family isn't entirely different from mine. Maybe just like with me, there's something in your family, something harmful, something hurtful. 
And it's been going on for as long as you can remember, like generation after generation. In my family, on my dad's side, that's been alcoholism. Uh, my dad was an alcoholic. If he was here this morning, he would probably describe himself as a recovering alcoholic, just because that's the language that lots of people use. But I'm happy to say my dad's been sober for years. I'm happy because, well, you know, looking back, I mean, his alcohol abuse cost him his marriage to my mother, and it almost cost him his second marriage. To see how my dad has put his life back together is an amazing thing. Like, the quality of his life is so much better um, now that he's sober than it was for years, even for decades. I'm, I'm really proud of him. But it wasn't just my dad. It was his dad before him. It was my grandfather. It's always odd to me to talk about him because, well, even as I am talking about him, I can't even see his face in my mind. Like I could probably count on one hand the number of times that I saw him growing up. And it's not because there was an opportunity. He lived well into my adulthood, but it's just that, well, he was, he was like estranged from the family. His, his fear of flying didn't help, but, but he just was not engaged at all with the rest of the family. You see, he and my grandmother, they were married and divorced twice to each other. They were married, they got divorced, they tried it again, they got divorced again. And no doubt, just like with my dad and with my mom, well, alcohol abuse was a major reason for both divorces. It's been, you know, an amazing thing really to think about the long-term effects of that. I mean, for my dad, that meant growing up largely without a father figure in the home, right? And, and, and it also, for my dad, it meant growing up largely in poverty. My dad and his brothers, my uncles, they lived with their mother, my grandmother, who lived with her mother, my great-grandmother, in public housing in San Bernardino, California. The project's called Waterman Gardens. And you know that that had to affect the way that my dad raised me and my sister Cheryl. It's been several years now since my grandfather passed. I don't even remember exactly what year it was, but I do remember that Shortly afterwards, I was in California attending one of our annual pastors' conferences. All the Calvary Chapel pastors from around the country and even sometimes other countries gather together. And, uh, and so I was there for that, and I stuck around an extra day after it had ended so I could see my dad. I was there at my dad's house, you know, just, just weeks, a couple months maybe after the funeral. And so my dad was talking about what it had been like for him to travel to Stockton where my grandfather had spent his final years and what it was like to enter his home and to go through his personal belongings. My dad, he asked me if I would wait right there for a minute. And he went in the other room and he came back with a box. Now maybe you have a box like this. Does anybody here have a box where you keep like mementos, keepsakes, stuff like that? I, I do. See, I've got, I've got a little wooden box that says San Diego on the front. I got it when I was a kid uh, on a trip to San Diego. And uh, inside that box is like my high school class ring, some, some cool stones, uh, some coins I've picked up in my travels to other countries. There's probably some stuff that's just junk in there too. But, but I, do, I do have this special box. And I have to admit, I haven't seen it for a couple of years. It's, it's in a storage unit outside Austin, Texas, where I pastored for 18 years. But I know it's there. So some of you guys know what I'm talking about, right? You've got one of those boxes too? So Grandpa had one of those boxes. My dad, he, he took the lid off and started to move things around inside the box. Started taking things out. He took out a document that was related to one of my grandparents' two divorces. And then he took out a picture of my grandfather holding my Uncle Bill on his knee. This is when Bill was a baby. And there he is on my grandfather's knee. Bill was later killed in action in Vietnam. And then he took out my kindergarten picture and my first grade picture and my second grade picture. Guys, I was blown away. Never in a million years would I have believed you if you had told me that my grandfather had pictures of me in his box. I, I felt conflicted about it, to be honest. There was a part of me that felt really, really, really good that I made grandpa's box. That even though I can barely remember his face, he thought that my face had a place in his box. But there was another part of me that felt really, really bad, and that was the part of me that realized that whereas my box, and probably your box too, is a box filled with memories, his was a box filled with regrets. His was a box filled with reminders of all the things that he'd had but lost. All the things that he might have enjoyed right up until the end of his life, but instead didn't get to enjoy at all. 
And so whether we're talking about my grandfather's story or whether we're talking about the backstory to Joshua chapter 2, it's a reminder that there has to come a time in our lives when we say enough is enough. It doesn't matter what has happened in our families or for how long it's been happening, that, that it stops here, it stops now, it stops with this generation, it stops with me. Can you feel the mood in Acacia Grove? Another similar observation from Acacia Grove. You see it there in the text where where it talks about Joshua sending spies into the land, right? And so that too takes us back a generation because Moses did the same thing. Moses sent spies into the land, except Moses sent 12 spies. And if you know the story, you know that 10 of those spies came back with a negative report. 10 of those spies were like, there is no way we can conquer the land. I don't care who God says we are. I don't care what God says we can do. There's no way we can do it. We shouldn't even try. Two guys came back with a positive report. One of those two was Joshua, by the way. And those two guys were like, oh, we so got this. We are exactly who God says we are. We can do exactly what God says we can do. Why are we wasting time having this conversation? Why are we not conquering the land right now? Come on, let's go. But sadly, as is often the faith, or often the case, that is, even in, a, even in a local church like this one, well, the negative voices, they carried the day. And as a result, an entire generation was doomed to die in the wilderness. Their sentence, 40 years with time served. I mean, for the best part of 40 years, they were going to have to walk through the desert waiting for everyone of a certain age to die. That's a lot of funerals. I mean, we can do the math. Um, if there were 1.2 million adults, and that's considered a conservative estimate, and if they uh, used every hour of daylight to bury someone, then that means funerals year after year, month after month, week after week, day after day, hour after hour, about seven, eight times per hour, they're burying someone. And you know that every single time another body slid beneath the sand, they would be reminded of what happens when we listen to the wrong voices. When we listen to anyone who says anything other than what God says about who we are or about what we can do. And maybe that's been your experience. I talk to people all the time where we're like, that's all they remember when they think back over their life. You know, maybe from your very earliest memories, you've been hearing a negative story about yourself. It, it could have been a parent. It could have been a sibling. Uh, maybe it was like a, a teacher or a coach, a classmate. It could have been um, even, you know, in your adult life, like it could be a coworker or an employer. It might even be your spouse. But for as long as you can remember, you've just been beat down by this negative story about yourself. And, and if that's the case for you, I'm so sorry. Because that is really hard to overcome. But isn't it true that for all of us, those of us that relate to that and those of us maybe who don't, that for all of us, the biggest problem isn't with the story that they tell us about us, but with the story that we tell ourselves. Have you spent a lifetime telling yourself that you're not enough? I mean, you know how it goes. It goes like this. I'm not tall enough. I'm not fast enough. I'm not handsome enough or beautiful enough. Um, I'm not educated enough. I'm not skilled enough. I'm not athletic enough. Um, It it can even be things like this. It could be like, like, I'm not cool enough. I'm not hip enough. You know, I'm not spiritual enough. I'm not good enough. And it's one more of those things where there has to come that point in our lives where we say enough is enough. That going forward, we're not going to listen to anyone, even if it's us who says anything other than what God says about who we are or about what we can do. Can you feel the mood in Acacia Grove? And so with that backstory, we kind of get back to the narrative and to the, the progression of what's happening. These spies, they were sent to gather intelligence. Notice it says, especially of Jericho. Now, if you go home and Google Jericho, you'll discover lots of information online. You'll discover that, that the city of Jericho claims to be one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. Now, you know, I don't know about that. What we're interested in knowing is what was Jericho like in ancient times, right? What was it like when our story takes place? And so maybe one of the first things you need to know, one of the most important things you need to know is that Jericho was heavily fortified with not one but two walls. So apparently the king of Jericho had promised voters that if elected, he would build a wall and Moab would pay for it. So up the wall went. 
Now, you know, in all seriousness, in ancient times, a wall was truly a matter of national security. I mean, in ancient Jericho, a wall was the difference between a good night's sleep and getting killed in your sleep. Your wife raped, your kids taken as slaves. That's the world they lived in. But what if having built a wall, you ran out of space? Well, then you'd come in and build another wall. So picture a second wall, a, a larger concentric circle. And the space between the two walls? Suburbs. Think old Jericho and new Jericho. Now just file that away because we're going to come back to it later. But the spies, no sooner do their feet hit the ground in Jericho than they're found in the red light district. What? <laughs> I mean, for real, if, if you were new to the Bible, you would never see that coming. Never in a million years would you expect to turn the page and find them there. Um, in a split second, we go from talking about the oldest city in the world to talking about the oldest profession. Before you get the wrong idea, I don't think the spies were at Rahab's place to get under the covers. I think they were there under cover. The success of their mission depended upon not drawing attention to themselves. My guess is that the closer they got to Jericho, uh, they probably joined or were joined by other people traveling that day. They likely entered the city as part of a larger group. Uh, they followed the flow of traffic to those parts of the city where tourists would go. But to take it a step further, we shouldn't underestimate the value that the spies might have placed on Rahab as a potential intelligence asset. I mean, think of it. There's no telling who she knew or what. It was reasonable to think that she might actually have access to information that no one else they were going to get close to would have access to. So it makes perfect sense that they would want to talk to someone like Rahab. All that to say that if there was anything inappropriate about their visit to Rahab's place, the Bible doesn't tell us so. But aren't you glad the Bible tells us the truth about Rahab? I love that for so many reasons. I'll, I'll share briefly just about one of the reasons I love that. I love it because today we hear these buzzwords in the culture at large, but a lot in the church too. We hear words like authenticity, transparency, vulnerability. We're so much better at talking about that stuff than we are at doing it. I mean, if you've been in church for long, you have had the same experience I've had. You, you were somewhere at some time when someone found their voice. They got brave, and they told their story. Or, or, or maybe they opened up about their struggles. Maybe they even admitted to having some questions or some doubts. And then you watched in horror as the people around them shamed them, shushed them, and shunned them. And you learned very quickly that it is not always safe to keep it real at church, no matter what we say but it should be, right? And in fact, if you were new to all of this and you read a Bible story like this one, wouldn't you expect it to be? When it tells us the truth about Rahab, the unvarnished truth about her, wouldn't you then expect that a community of faith like a local church would be a place where you could keep it real? Well, we need to stop waiting for somebody else to change that. We have to change that ourselves. I mean, wherever we find ourselves, you are in a grace-giving church, and I'm so glad that you are. But what if you and I found ourselves at some future time in a place where, where, where grace wasn't a part of the culture? You know how we could change it? If we just agreed to do two things. If we all agreed that, number one, we were going to be brave and tell our stories. And then number two, when anyone else got brave and told their stories, we absolutely refused to be a part of that group that would otherwise shame, shush, or shun them. If we all just got on the same page with that, we could immediately change culture wherever we found ourselves. You know, it's kind of funny because when you think about Rahab, I mean, what do you think they thought about Rahab? How do you think they talked about Rahab? You know, because you know what we think about people today and, and, and what we say about people today who, who do things that we don't approve of, right? And yet, let's just think about it for a minute. Rahab may have done what she did as a matter of survival. Am I saying that what Rahab did was okay? No, it was not okay. Just like lots and lots and lots of things that I've done are not okay. But the ancient world definitely was different than the modern world. I was, you know, I was kidding about a campaign issue from last year just a few minutes ago. Another thing we heard a lot about last year was equal pay. And I'm so glad that we're talking about that. I mean, I think that, that we've made a ton of progress in our country, but most people would agree that we've still got work to do. So we need to keep having that conversation and we need to keep addressing that. But think about what it was like for women in the ancient world. I mean, if you were living in ancient Jericho as a woman and you were not married and you did not have financial help from your family, you were in a struggle to survive. It's not like Rahab could just put on her career hat and reinvent herself. She couldn't just jump on LinkedIn and start networking. I mean, 
You know, it just didn't work like that. And so what I'm saying is that many times in the ancient world, and maybe, maybe more often than we suppose in the modern world, there have been women so desperate to find a way to survive another day, another week, another month that they've thought about doing things or even done things that they never would have dreamed of doing. So when you think about it, I mean, however troubling it is for us to learn this about her, and it is troubling, right? It should be. We should be troubled by this. But however troubling it is for us to learn this about her, it's not half as troubling as it was for her to live it. And the other thing I'm getting at is is this. I'll, I'll put it as a question. Aren't we learning that life is so much better when we take even five minutes to put ourselves in someone else's shoes before we decide that they don't matter? that they don't count, that they don't have any value, or even that we know like everything there is to know about what they're doing or why they're doing it, because we don't. Could Rahab live heroically? Well, not unless she let go of the past. I mean, think about all of the guilt from her past. Think of all the guys. Think of all the hookups. Do you have a past? Are there skeletons in your closet? I mean, the truth is, we all have things that, that we're ashamed of. We've all done things that we're embarrassed about. We've all done things that make us feel guilty. But one of the biggest mistakes that we can make in our lives is when we allow our past to control our future. And you know why we let guilt from our past rob us of the future that God has for us? It's because we don't get forgiveness. I don't mean that we haven't received it. I mean, if you're a follower of Christ, you know that you've been forgiven. What I mean is we don't get it up here. That we really struggle to wrap our minds around the idea that God has forgiven us or that as we sometimes say, God forgives and forgets. Think of that Bible verse that says that God takes our sin and he dumps it into the sea. I love that verse. I want you to get a visual on it right now. At this very moment, God is gathering up every sin Alan Rigg has ever committed. Get comfortable. This could take a while. (laughs) Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait. Okay, he's got it. Now, he's dumping it into the Mediterranean Sea. I want you to picture the storm surge. Beaches all around the Mediterranean are being covered with water. Coastal cities are disappearing as my sin is sinking into the deep, dark depths of the Mediterranean. In a field of bubbles, finally, it hits the the seabed, the seafloor, sending silt in every direction that only slowly begins to settle until finally my sin covered and no one can see it no one's going to find it and no one's ever going to dredge it up not even god himself because he promises not to with that visual in mind do you think there could ever come a time in your life or in mine when we are allowing guilt from our past to rob us of the future that god has for us that god might look at us and say i'm over it why aren't you If you allowed a handful of guilty memories to control your life, to define you, to tell you who you are, those things are part of your story, but they're not your whole story. God is still writing your story. And there has to come that time in our lives when we say, enough is enough. That moving forward, we're not going to live from that guilty place anymore, but we're going to live from that forgiven place instead. For Rahab, I think there was not only the guilt, I think there was hurt. I think she'd had a falling out with her family, hurt from her past. Um, You know, admittedly, this is conjecture on my part, but we're going to learn in just a few verses that she had family in Jericho. So so if they weren't, as best we can tell, trying to rescue her from this lifestyle, if they weren't, as best we can tell, trying to help her financially, is it not at least possible that they'd had a falling out? That they might not even have been speaking that she was hurt, that they were hurt, that there was more than enough hurt to go around. There usually is, right? Have you been hurt? Is there resentment or anger or bitterness in your life? I mean, the truth is we've all been hurt. And you know why hurt from our past robs us of the future that God has for us? It's because we don't give forgiveness. So guilt robs us because we don't get forgiveness. Hurt robs us because we don't give it. Have you guys ever heard that saying, hurt people hurt people? And that is so true. And one of the ways that you and I try to hurt the people who've hurt us is to be all like this, like, no, I'm not going to forgive you. You owe me. You owe it to me to be miserable for a really long time. You owe it to me to be miserable for the rest of your life. I mean, it gets so bad that we're laying in bed at night and we're, we're telling ourselves stories like this one, like, I hope I never see them again. 
No, I hope I do, because I've got a thing or two to say to them. What if, uh, what if I ran into them like at the hardware store, the grocery store? I'd act like I didn't even know them. That'd be good. Well, no, because i got these zingers I've been working on, so I'd have to approach them. So I'd go up to them, and I'd say this, and they'd be speechless. That'd be awesome. Well, no, because i got more zingers, so they'd have to respond. So I'd say this, and they'd say that, and they'd be really stupid, so then I'd follow with this. Here they are at home. I mean, they don't even know we're thinking that stuff. Or worse, they know, and they totally do not care. This is why we say that forgiveness is a gift that we give ourselves. When I forgive someone who's hurt me, I effectively end any control that they have over my life. Now, I know that if you've been hurt recently or deeply, that's hard to hear. You're like, who is this guy? Who invited him anyway? Like, I mean, I came here to sing the songs and pray the prayers and hear a message that I thought might be kind of inspiring, and he's telling me I have to forgive. He doesn't know what they did to me. He doesn't know how they hurt me. Somebody get him off the stage. I mean, I understand. I do. Maybe it would help if I differentiated between two things. Because I'm only talking about one of these two things. You know that there's a world of difference between forgiveness and reconciliation, right? I'm, I'm just talking about forgiveness. Um, reconciliation takes two. For that reason alone, reconciliation is not always possible. Now, you'll hear that in church. You want me to add something that you won't hear as often in church? This is like the director's cut. This is when you buy the DVD the day it drops, and it's got all the bonus features. You ready for this? Not only is reconciliation not always possible, but it isn't always, not always, not in every single case, not in every single situation desirable. Um, A couple examples from what you've heard already this morning. Take my dad. For someone in recovery, there are people that it's just not safe for you to be reconciled to if you want to stay sober. Or take a case like Miranda's, the victim of domestic violence. Uh, It would not have been safe for her or for our daughter for there to have been reconciliation. But while it takes two people to reconcile, it takes one person to forgive. You can't, I can't decide all by ourselves to let go of the sense that somebody owes us. You know, again, I can imagine the pushback. But if I forgive them, then I'm saying that what they did wasn't wrong. I'm saying that what they did didn't hurt. No, you'd be saying no such thing. What would you be saying? You'd be saying what they did was wrong, what they did did hurt, but holding this relational IOU over their head is tearing me up, so I'm tearing it up. I refuse to lose even one more day of my life to this feeling of angst, like like 24-7, about this unresolved relational thing. So I'm letting go of past hurt. You know, again, it's one more of those things where, where have you allowed a handful of hurtful memories to control your life, to define you to tell you who you are. Those hurtful memories are a part of your story, but they're not your whole story. God is still writing your story. And we can say enough is enough. Going forward, I'm not going to live from that hurt place. I'm going to live from this forgiving place instead. So the idea is to let go of the past. Here's the second thing we can learn from Rahab about living heroically. We've got to face our fears. We're going to start moving more quickly. Otherwise, we'll be here till late tonight. Verse 2, it says that it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. So the spies had been followed. They'd been found out. Could Rahab live heroically? Not unless she faced her fears. Fear is such a universal thing. Have you guys ever seen that website, phobialist.com? You got to check it out later. Like like on phobialist.com, they've cataloged hundreds of things that people are afraid of. It's like, it's like you're afraid of stuff you hadn't even thought of yet. It's crazy. Anybody here afraid of heights? Yeah, see, most of you are not even raising your hand all the way up over your head because that would be just like <laughs> too far off the ground. Anybody here have like an unnatural fear of needles? I mean, nobody likes them, but it's like a real fear, yeah. What about like an unnatural fear of spiders? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God bless you, sister. (laughs) Anybody here afraid to raise their hand in public? All right, you pass. I think there's probably some coffee in the lobby or something. You can 
The rest of us have more work to do. I'm, I'm thinking of this picture that was taken of my adult daughter, Lauren, uh, when she was a kid. Now, Lauren's 25. She's a new mom. Um, she is the children's ministry director at Calvary Chapel in Tallahassee, Florida. If you're asking yourselves, I wonder if their tour is going to take them to Tallahassee this fall. Of course it is. Cannot wait to get to Tallahassee and see that grandbaby. But when Lauren was a little girl, she was terrified of people in costumes, which is why I thought it was a terrible idea the year she wanted to celebrate her birthday at Chuck E. Cheese, <laughs> where the whole point is to have a person in costume come to the table. So, so the moment when this picture was taken is the moment when the rat is stalking the birthday girl. You know, Chucky's coming in. And uh, so Lauren has jumped up in my arms. Man, I'm holding her tight. She's holding me tight. Her eyes, bigger than the pizzas on the table. It's crazy. Whether it was Lauren's childhood fear of people in costumes or my nearly crippling fear of a coffee shortage, we've, <laughs> we've all got stuff that freaks us out, right? And fear is so powerful. Like, let's break it down. Have you ever been so scared that you've done something you would normally do? I totally have. Or have you ever been so scared that you didn't do something you normally would do? I've totally done that too. So it's powerful. And maybe that's why the most common command in the Bible is do not be afraid. Did you know that? Seriously, of all the do's and don'ts in the Bible, this one occurs more than any other. Do not be afraid. Now, here's the interesting thing. This timeline I've been creating. If, if guilt and hurt are over here in our past, we usually think about fear as being over here in the future, right? We're afraid that this is going to happen or we're afraid that that's not going to happen. But don't make the mistake of thinking that these things are disconnected. They're not. You know what I'm learning? I'm learning that in life, if I don't make peace with the past, I will almost always fear the future. And Rahab, she had every reason to be afraid. I mean, she was about to risk her life to hide the spies and to lie for them, which raises an ethical issue, right? Was it okay? Was it not okay for her to lie? Well, we can't spend long on this because we need to keep moving um, but let me just give you a very brief take. Would that be okay? You guys want to know what I think about whether this was okay, not okay? All right, so here's what I would say. I would compare what Rahab did to what people in Europe during World War II did, who took Jews into their homes. Maybe they even, um, you know, like built safe space in which they could hide. And then if Nazi soldiers came knocking on the door and demanding to know whether Jews were present, they lied, and they said no. They chose life-saving over truth-telling when it wasn't possible to do both. Two absolute moral obligations came into unavoidable conflict, and they chose the greater good, I believe, without guilt. That's what I would say about what they did in World War II. That's what I would say about what Rahab did. Now, we can disagree about that, and be friends, but I at least wanted to give you a quick, a quick take on that. She could have played it safe, right? She could have. Have you ever played it safe only to regret it later? Of course, right? What about that time that you struck out looking? And all these years later, you're still like, oh, if only I'd taken a cut at that pitch. What about that time that you knew the answer, but you literally could not get your voice to come out of your throat? That time that you wanted to volunteer, but you could not put pen to paper and write your name at the end of a list. That time that you couldn't make up your mind about the house or the car and somebody else got it. Or that time, you know the one, where you were so close to telling someone how you really felt about them. But you chickened out. Maybe you never got another opportunity. You know, Rahab, she could have played it safe. She could have refused to hide the spies. She could have refused to lie for them. Instead, she risked the life that she had, the only life that she knew, for the life that she wanted. To live heroically, you must always risk your life as it is, and that's scary. That's why we have to face our fears. Now, you could already be like, have you met me? Do I look like a risk taker? Are you one of those people who describe yourselves as having a low risk tolerance or maybe no risk tolerance at all? I don't buy it. I was in a bookstore not long ago. You guys remember those? They had shelves, these things with pages. They were really cool. And so I took this book off the shelf and I was looking at the title. The title was The 100 Most Dangerous Things in Everyday Life and What to Do About Them. Do not read that book. That book wrecked my mind. I mean, I had no idea that every year in the United States, more people are killed by teddy bears than by grizzly bears. Who knew? <laughs> like a button can come off, you can have a, you know, a tragic choking incident. Did you know that every year in the United States, 40,000 people are injured by their television set? 
Now, I have to admit, more than once, we've been watching AFV, America's Funniest Videos, and you'll see like a couple of kids roughhousing, and they're rolling across the room, and they, they roll into a piece of furniture that starts to wobble, a TV falls off, you can have a crushing injury. All right, against my better judgment, one more example. Did you know that every year in the United States, 60,000 people are injured using the toilet? Right? So don't tell me you're not a risk taker. Unless you're prepared to hold it <laughs> forever. The question is not whether to risk, but what? So listen, will you risk the life that you have for the life that you want, the life that God wants for you? Or are you going to risk the life that you want, the one that God wants for you, to hold on to the life that you have? You know, the idea here is that we have to face our fears. In the verses we're about to read, Rahab uses, in verse 9, fear words, and in verse 11, fear phrases. But by the time you get to the New Testament, it says nothing about her fear, everything about her faith, which teaches us what? It teaches us something completely counterintuitive about what it means to live heroically. We think that heroes feel no fear, but Rahab was scared out of her mind. So Rahab teaches us that it's not that heroes feel no fear, they do but they refuse to be controlled by it. So you and I, we keep waiting for the day that we're going to wake up and we're not afraid to take that next step. That day's never going to come. What we are empowered by God to do is to take that next step in the midst of fear, to not be controlled by that fear. So imagine a thought life that's not fueled by fear. Imagine future plans that aren't formed in fear. Imagine a life that isn't just completely controlled by fear. That's a game changer. So if we're going to live heroically, we have to let go of the past, we have to face our fears, and finally we have to believe. Look at verse 8. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who are on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token. And spare my father, mother, brothers, sisters, and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. Now, we've got a few more verses to read quickly, but first let your eyes fall in verse 11. Notice what she said. She spoke of one God, singular. She spoke of a personal God when she used the pronoun your. And she spoke of an all-powerful, everywhere present at once God when she described him as being, quote, in heaven above and on earth beneath, end quote. This is the language of faith. What I'm saying is that Rahab had come to believe. So picking it up in verse 14. The men answered her, our lives for yours if none of you tell this business of ours. And it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall. And she said to them, get to the mountain lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go your way. So the men said to her, we will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, mother, brothers, and all your father's household to your own home. So it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be in his own head, and we'll be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath, which you made us swear. And then she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away and they departed and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. Now notice quickly in verse 15, it says not once but twice that she lived on the wall, the city wall. So, so I'm way, way over here now because you and I are on the approach to Jericho, okay? And we can, we can see the inner wall, but we're focused on the outer wall where Rahab lived. When you go home, if you were to Google Jericho, I told you you'd find all kinds of resources. I mean, there's things to read, there's videos to watch, there's documentaries. They won't agree on all the, the physical details, but, but, but at least one source that I consulted tells me that this might be what we see. As we look at that outer wall, we see like a 15-foot earthen embankment. And then on top of that, like a 25-foot brick wall. So altogether about 40 feet, right? All right, so we're looking not only at the wall, we're looking at Rahab's window. Let's approach. So we walk toward it. We come right up to the wall, right up underneath Rahab's window. We're looking up 40 feet, which raises a question. What in the world was Rahab doing with a 40 or 50 foot rope laying around the house? I mean, did everybody in Jericho keep a 50 footer on the coffee table? 
Did only people living in the wall keep one on a hook by the window? I don't know, but I'm guessing these were not the first men to make a hasty escape from Rahab's place. Just throwing that out there. Now, she wasn't letting them go anywhere until she had a deal with them, which raises a better question than the rope question, as entertaining as that is, at least to me. Why didn't she go with them? She could have led them to a cave in the hill country of Judah. And then when it was safe, she could have followed them to Acacia Grove. What if they didn't come back? Or what if they came back, but they didn't keep the deal? Or what if before they could come back and keep the deal, she was found out? They would have killed her for sure if they had any idea what she was up to, right? There's only one reason, and that's her family. That family. The family that, as far as we can tell, had nothing to do with her or or, or she with them. It's crazy. Could Rahab live heroically? Not unless she believed. Not unless she believed in God, which we saw in verse 11, she had come to faith. Not unless she believed in herself, by which I mean the woman that God was making her. And not unless she believed in the future, her future, by which I mean the future that God was forming for her, but not for her alone, for others too. It's kind of crazy when you think about it as it relates to Rahab because she had so many reasons not to care about anyone's future but her own. You know, she'd been overlooked by all of the eligible bachelors of Jericho. She'd been used by immoral men from far and wide. She'd apparently been abandoned by her own family. Who would blame her for wanting to get out and never look back? But the idea is to believe God for a big future that makes us and others bigger. And we love to think in these terms. As Christians, we love to talk about vision. We've got vision for our you know, family and vision for our job and vision for our church. Sometimes we describe that as like having a God-given dream. So listen, if your God-given dream is only big enough for you, that's not God's dream for you. God's dream for you will always be so big that there's room in it for you and for others. And Rahab is the most amazing case in point. By the time you get to chapter 6, you discover that Rahab and her family were spared. And then just two verses later, we learn that when Joshua was written, that Rahab was alive and well and living as a part of their community. How cool is that? That's cool, right? Not half as cool as this. Because you get to the end of the Old Testament. And then you turn through those blank pages between the Testaments. And then you turn to the first page of the New Testament. You turn to the first book and the first chapter of the first book and the first verses of the first chapter. And there you find a tree, but not just any tree, a family tree. And not even just any family tree, Jesus' family tree. You know what this means, right? It means that not only had Rahab continued to live as a part of their community, but it means that she'd fallen in love, that she'd gotten married, that she'd had kids who had kids who had kids, until finally one of her descendants was Jesus, God in the flesh, the Savior of the world, who many rightly see in the color of the cord She was instructed to tie in her window that scarlet cord suggesting the blood that Jesus would later shed to make all this cool stuff that we're talking about possible. Oh my goodness. I mean, clearly Rahab had an amazing ability to believe God for a bigger, better future. Do you think that even Rahab could have imagined this? From prostitute to mother? How long? How long had Rahab worn a great, big label that said prostitute and god just comes along and takes hold of the corner of that label and listen rip and in its place he puts a new label that says mother earlier you heard a little bit of miranda's story not so much about mine but i went through similar things in a similar time period Uh, my wife left me and, and our then 17 year old daughter and and Just like Miranda described, I mean, I lost my marriage, I lost my ministry, I lost all my material things. I vividly remember returning my car. I vividly remember the day the foreclosure notice was on my front door. We both know what it's like to have your whole world turned completely upside down. We both know what it's like to wear a label that says divorced and to have some people in your world who won't ever let you forget. God comes along and he takes hold of the corner of Miranda's label that says divorced. And listen, rip! And in its place, he puts a new label that says wife. He takes hold of the corner of my label that says divorced. Rip! And in its place, puts a new label that says husband. What label do you need to see and hear God tearing from you this morning? 
failure. Rip. Loser. Rip. Sinner. Rip. What label do you need to see God putting in its place? In just a moment, I'm going to say a prayer. Miranda's going to sneak back up so that we can do one last worship song together. Before I pray, I've got a thought about what you should do when you get home. Isn't that thoughtful of me to plan your afternoon for you? <laughs> when you get home, I want you to find a tattered old bath towel and a safety pin. And wrap that towel around your shoulders, pin it up tight, and begin to live heroically as you let go of past guilt and hurt. As you face your fears, feeling them fully but refusing to be controlled by them. And as you believe God for a bigger, better future for you and for the people around you. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for bringing us to this place where we could sing together and pray together and study your word together. We're grateful that you answered the prayer I offered at the beginning of the message to come and to be present and to speak powerfully into our lives. And even as we sing this last song together, we want it, Lord, to be a way of responding to you. Perhaps the words to the song itself can be our response. For others, maybe we'll want to pray under our breath as, as the people in front of us and behind us are singing, but, but may we respond. And I just want to pray for those, Lord, here who maybe, like Rahab might have felt, perhaps today they, they feel like outsiders. They wonder if you're against them. They wonder if their past choices have ruined any hope for a better future. And Lord, this story tells us, well, it tells us that you take outsiders and make them insiders, that that you're for us and not against us, that no matter what our past looks like, that you have the ability to make something beautiful out of our lives. And we're so grateful for that. So grateful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand.